Recording, yay, we're there. <laughs> Hi, this is Joe Musaro with Yahweh Sisterhood Book Club and Yahweh Sisterhood, Sisterhood International. So we're excited to have you with us tonight, and we are thrilled to have Michelle Medlock Adams with us. Hi, girl. <laughs> hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> oh, well, we are thrilled. Um, I met Michelle last year. I don't know if you remember this, but we were at Taylor University, and you yes. spoke at the very end. And I have to tell you that everybody was just going crazy because what you spoke into our lives was so wonderful. And I have, I have made so many notes and every once in a while I'll go back and look at those notes just to remind Aww, me of what you, you said. <laughs> and so she's with us. I mean, I could say all these things about her. She's an award-winning author. She is one of the people that I would say that gives so much of her time to other people. Mm -hmm. I see your heart all the time. Every time I see something about you, it's not just you just don't write books and but you give so much of yourself, like I said, and um, and that's one of the things like I, I just love about you because because if God is gifting us with things, I so believe that we should be able to share those with other people. Amen. I'm with you on that. And I made a promise to. And I was actually at the Right to Publish conference back in would have been like '99. That was like the first time I'd gone to that conference. Lynn Johnson runs it's a great conference there at Wheaton University, and I'd flown all the way from Texas to go to this conference. And I, I couldn't wait. It was a writing for children class. And I, you know, I was just getting into that. I, had, I was a journalist, but I didn't know how to do children's stuff. And I, I was just so fired up. I and mean, I prayed about it. And, you know, it, it was expensive. So it was like my birthday, my anniversary. Everything was pulled into one gift for me to go to this conference. I was just so excited. And I get to the first class. And I won't tell you who it is because you might know her. But the lady that was teaching children's, she said, um, so here's the thing. <laughs> when they start like that, you know good she's like if there's any other class you could go to I would just do that because it's really hard to break into children's right now and um, even though I'm really like very published I'm having trouble so I just it's just gonna be a waste of time for you to be in my class this week so if you're new to this um, I would just see if there's another class you want to take oh my gosh <laughs> all the way from Texas to Chicago <laughs> like, you know holidays worth of presents to get to come and I thought are you kidding me right now and I'm just you know I, I've, I've often thought I wonder how many people in that class gave up that day I'm just Cassie enough that I knew God had called me. I'm like, well, I don't care about this woman. She doesn't affect my destiny with what God has for me. Amen. But I had a room, we stayed in the dorms. I was in this dorm room that night by myself. I had a room by myself. And I prayed to the Lord and I said, Lord, if I ever make it, make it in you know, the world standards, if I ever get published and, and I can help others, I promise you I will not do what that woman just did because that was horrible. I will be the one that will give and I, and I will teach. And, you know, if you open the doors, I will walk through them because I don't want that to happen to anybody else. I mean, I really, it was one of those kind of moments where you write it down in your journal. Like, I vowed to God I would do that. And then, I mean, my career just took off. And, like, I've never forgotten that. So I, I hardly ever say no. If, if I can go, I mean, if it's not, you know, I have to check with my family. But I just go because um, I made that promise to God. And, and plus, I just like hanging out with writers. But um, it's, it's, it's a privilege. I mean, people have helped me along the way. If you don't reach back and help others, then shame on you. That's what I think. <laughs> Yeah, that's why I'm so giving, but I appreciate you saying that because that means a lot to me. Oh, I'm so glad because like I said, I you have spoken into my life and, and I hope to, you know, my goal is and the things that I strive to do are to take that what you have taught me and given to me, like you're paying it forward. Yes, that's exactly what we're supposed to do. Yeah. That's right. I love yeah. that. So let's just talk about your book, which I absolutely love. Oh, my newest one. I'm so, so excited about this one. Um, what is America? It came out in April, but actually they pr really promoted it all through June and July because of July the 4th. It's not just a July the 4th book. I mean, it's, it's just a book about America, but every time it's going to be like a Veterans Day or Memorial Day, they're probably going to hit it a little harder. But this book was birthed in my heart a year ago in February. Um, end of February, I, I was teaching at the Florida Christian Writers Conference in Lake Yale. Eva Marie Everson runs that and Mark Hancock. Eva's my, Eva Diva, she's my buddy. So I just finished up there, and Kyle Young, who's my agent, and his wife, Patty, and my really good friend, Wendy Lanier, her daughter works at Epcot, and she got us tickets for free. You cannot say no to a free ticket to Epcot, <laughs> even though we were exhausted. We were exhausted from the conference, and we were getting ready to go teach a serious writer event in Tallahassee. We went. We, just, we only had like six hours. So we went to Epcot, and um, I went to the American Adventure. It was hot, so we, surprisingly, it was already hot in February. So we went to this American Adventure and, and sat, and I had not been in there probably had been over a decade. And it was so wonderful. I mean, have you ever been to that show that's yeah. like animatronics? So um, it's Thomas Edison and I forget who else comes up out of the floor. But they they come up and then they they tell the whole history of America and the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's such a music and there's this big 
you know, four big different screens and there's all these images of, of all the different things, space shuttles and just all these amazing feats that America has had and some things that have been sorrowful as well. And I don't know, I mean, I'm a big sap, but I just bawled. I mean, I, it was so moving to me. It took me by surprise how, how greatly it affected me. And I looked down and Patty Piles' wife was crying. I'm like, oh good, I'm not the only one. It was so emotional. So we left, you know, you had to file out in single file. As we were walking down the stairs out of that big assembly there, I looked at Kyle and I said, I'm gonna write something about this for kids. And he said, no, you should. I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. Like, I want kids to feel exactly how I feel right now. The patriotism I feel, the love for my country, how blessed I feel. I'll put that in words for kids. And he said, I think that's a great idea. So before we left the park that day, God was kind of just writing it, you know, like I was getting downloads and I'm just, I'm, I'm using eyeliner in my purse, whatever I can to write stuff down. And I'll look, you always have to have paper when you're a writer, but I took a smaller purse because we were at an amusement park, but I was writing half of it before we got home and I finished it um, before we left um, Florida. And that book is what came out where the kids bought it as part of what is series. I already had what is Thanksgiving and what is Christmas, what is Easter and what is Halloween. I already had those. But this was the, the final, not the final installment, but the last installment. And I'm, it was, because it was birthed there, because of the, just the whole story around it, like a lot of people were expecting this because I'd shared, I said, you have to be ready when God starts downloading things to you. Because sometimes when you're least expecting it, you know, you're tired, you just finished conference, you're at, you're at an amusement park, and God's like, hey, I got a book for you. You have to, <laughs> you know, because you don't want to miss it, because this was right. so special. But yeah, I, I think, you know, every last book that you do is always your favorite. I think writers are notorious for that. But this one truly is because of, how it was birthed and how much I love this country. And because of the, 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 really the polarizations, even since the last election, you know, there's times people don't even speak that you lose friendships on Facebook. If you post something oh. about one party or the other. And my sister and I were talking about that today. It is, it is still volatile and I don't think it's going to get any better. And I, when I wrote this, I thought, wouldn't it be something because who's going to read this? Well, their the parents and the grandmamas and grandpapas can read it to the kids if they would, if they would take to heart what God put on my heart for them and make some of this crazy division in our country could just be, be no more. You know, the only time I can remember us all coming together was after that national tragedy of 9-11. Everybody came together. It didn't matter if you were a Democrat or Republican or, right. or independent, you were American. That's what mattered. You, we were all here together. We were standing as one, united we stand. And I think that lasted a couple of months and then it was done. And I, I don't know, I just wish we could get that back. And I, and I think our kids need to know that that's what it's all about. So can I read a little bit of it? Oh, yes, definitely. I want you to. Oh, I love it so much. So it's called, What is America? And all my books start the same, asking the question. So what is America about? I really want to know. Is it just some place we live, a place where tourists go? And Amy Wilmer is the artist on this. She uh, did all the books. She's amazing. Is it about July the 4th? I really love that day. I like to watch the fireworks. We cheer and shout, hooray. We just did that in our town. Did you guys see that? <laughs> it was beautiful. Is it about red, white, and blue? Is it about our song? Is it about the pledge we learned? I say it loud and strong. You know, we hope that they would still do that in the schools. Yes. And I love this one. Is it about our grand old flag that flies so proud and high? Is it about the bald eagle that soars across the sky? Look at this eagle, it's like you could touch his wings. It's just beautiful. Love the artwork. And then, no, that's not what America is about. While all these symbols are quite nice, they're only a small part. America was built on faith. That's how it got its start. And so that was an important line I thought to have in there. It's more than just a song we sing of amber waves of grain. America survived it all through every growing pain. That's my favorite spread because it looks like Indiana. That looks like Indiana yes. near me. Yes. Um, and let's just a couple more. It's more than just one way to think. Sometimes we disagree. That's why we vote. We have a voice. That's part of being free. Amen to that. The people in this melting pot, the ones who lend a hand, the ones who dream and work so hard, they make this land so grand. Okay, now I get it. The pledge, the flag, the fireworks, the anthem we adore, they represent America, but there is so much more. Uh, America is blessed by God. There's nothing we can't do. What is America? I know, this one always gets me. <laughs> My home where dreams come true, and there's Lady Liberty. Like, I still can't get to that spread and not lose it. I love that so much. And when we were in New York for the Book Expo of America, um, we took, we went over to Battery Park, and, you know, you can see 
uh, Statue of Liberty in the, in the background, and, and Kyle took my picture with the book in front of it. It was just, it was just one of those, those hollowed moments. I don't know. I was just like, oh, Lord, thank you that, you know, you gave this book to me and that you trusted me with it and that you allowed it to be published. And I just, I pray over it every day that whoever picks it up, it'll be, you know, received with the same way that I wrote it. So thanks for letting me share this. Truly, it's, it's my favorite. So I'm so excited to see what God's going to do with it. Well, I love it, especially too, because of that last page, because oh. my grandmother came over from Italy in 1915 and oh. she shared with me what it was like to actually see the Statue of Liberty when, you know, when their ship was coming. Oh, I love that. And, um, and I actually, and they moved, you know, they ended up coming through the city and then they moved upstate in New York. And I, just as a side note, everybody, I just found a picture back in New York of my family's garage in 1924, which nobody knew even existed, but I found it. And I'm so grateful to cook. God put me in this place where I could do some research just to have that picture is just, oh, sure. yes. And those were, you know, your family coming over, starting with nothing mm -hmm. and having a dream and trusting God. And I love that. so it means that book is, I understand it totally and completely what you're saying. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a special thing. I think, you know, our, our generation, we, we kind of, we still have that patriotic heart. We still, you know, we, we stand for the national anthem and we put our hand over our heart. I, I'm from, you know, well, you are too, you're in Ohio, but the Midwest, we oh, seem to Indiana. Are you in Indiana? I thought you were in Ohio. I'm in Fort Wayne. Ah, you're, so you're right there where Taylor is, where the, right. I, as well was that's where I used to teach at Fort Wayne um, I thought you were in Ohio well see that's here's the thing about the Midwestern folk we and we Hoosiers there's this there's like this Bible Belt and I think there's still a lot of patriotism here not that there isn't other places but I just I looked around on July the 4th and there was all these people downtown and in, in my little small town actually it was the weekend before we do ours the weekend before and um they played that we had this huge flag in front of our courthouse and they played the national anthem and I looked around and there was nobody taking a knee or everybody was standing with their hand over their heart. Little kids to people who, had, who weren't standing before because they weren't hardly able yeah. had people put them up to stand. And I, again, I'm a big blubber baby. I was, I just, there were just tears because I just, I see that, that love of country. And, you know, that's, I love that. And so that was neat to see that even, even now I still see, there are still pockets of that. You don't see a lot of it on the news, but there are still pockets of, of Americans who are still happy to be here and, and grateful to God for our, for our heritage of freedom. Well, one of the things I wanted to talk about tonight was, you know, starting, how would you look at writing, uh, in writing a children's book? I know for myself, I'm very new to this and, and I'm, my next goal is to write a children's book. I have my character. Oh, good. He is Winston, the British bulldog. Oh, well, <laughs> you love dogs, you're good there. That's going to be good. And you wonder who he's named after? <laughs> Winston I think, Churchill. <laughs> yeah, I think I know. I was gonna, that would be my guess. That's a cool that would be your guess, yes. So I know there's a lot involved, and I know that you're the person who could really lead us into this discussion. And um, some of the women were saying if they have any questions after we post this, if I can get them to you and maybe you could answer them for them. Sure. And I'd be happy to send, I have, I teach this, you know, um, at Taylor, but I write children which is like six no it's four classes eight hour classes and then I teach at lots of writers conferences so I have a lot of really great handouts I'm happy to share some with your group that would so be great send them to you and then you can you can share them but I think um there, I'll probably just start with this one that talks it's called the road to publication like how do you get a children's book published I'll just kind of go through some things okay Thing you kind of have to determine is who your um, audience is because there are different genres in, within children's so I just read this little board book this is um, you know for like I think they say two to five they've even got board books now that are for newborns they're caught there I just I bought a couple because I've got two little grandbabies in my family that are like less than six months and um, so they're, they're all the way from zero to like five are usually board books and then you go into picture books you know picture books are like um, they're a little bit bigger. They can be 12 page or 32 page. This is one that Little Lamb did this year. Mm -hmm. You still have all the beautiful artwork. The artwork still carries the story. I mean, if, if the pictures are bad, the book won't sell. But board books can be different sizes and, and picture books can be different sizes. Um, but the, the, the thing about board books is they're all hard. You know, the kids can drool on them, fill their juice box, they're still good. And the, a lot of board books, there's another category in board books that a lot of people um, enjoy is, is like the... Uh, 
if there's any kind of novelty thing, like a, like a pull the flap, lift a flap, you know, those, or push a button, like I had a happy birthday when it sang the happy birthday song on it, like um, anything, if there's bells and whistles, anything like that, that's, that, that would be a, a novelty book, but it's usually a board book. It's like a specialty of that. Concept books are usually board books, ABC books and um, counting books. I had one that was counting cows and it was like kind of black fuzzy book. Look like a whole, like, is that the Holstein cow? Yeah, black and white. Cool things like that. Um, so those are all in the board book category. You've got the picture books. Picture books is where most people like to write. Now for your book, is this going to be a picture book, you think, or like a middle grade or what is it? I think, I think it may be a, a picture book. Yeah, I, I mean, if I were going to guess with the, with the Bulldog, the, um, that's one thing that I always teach is people are like, well, I don't know exactly. I've got the story in my head, but I don't know who it's for yet. And typically, you know, this is not a hard and fast rule because there are no hard and fast rules in writing, really. Um, we like to be rule breakers. That's just who we are. But your character determines kind of your age group. So if, if, um, if it's an animal that you that's your main character, typically that's going to be, you know, for the picture book or board book or early reader. But then, you know, you've got the secrets of Nim and some of those that are for older or the tales of Despero, which are for older kids, even though it's mice. So that, that's not like I said, it's not hard and fast rule, but usually if it's an animal, it's probably going to be for that age group, which would be like the zero to five or the six to 10, 10 being the very oldest for a picture book. Um, then you've got early, or easy to reads um, or emergent readers, some people call them. And then you, and there's, there's a lot of those, a lot of teachers are really great at writing those because they know how to do all the, all the digraphs and things. Then you go into chapter books in middle grade and young adult. And, and of course, you've also got fiction and nonfiction. And, you know, after young adult and teen, they've even got something called new adult, which goes, which there's not too much going on in that category, but that is a category. So, and there's, there's just so many areas in, within those categories. Those are like the, the hard and fast categories. But, you know, within those, you've got things such as um, devotionals, which that's a nonfiction project. So if you could write a devotional for adults, you could probably write one for kids. That's how I got into it. So like my Dinosaur Devotions came out last year with Tommy Nelson. Um, it's nonfiction. And it's for ages 8 to 12. So if you're like a nonfiction person, you're a journalist, and you like to write like that, you should dive head first into nonfiction. In fact, right now, nonfiction is selling, outselling fiction like two to one. Nonfiction is sort of the easiest way to break into children's. That would be one of my key pieces of advice is if you really wanted to break into children's and get a book out, you should dive into nonfiction. Keep working on your fiction, but nonfiction is the way to really break into the children's market right now. It has been for a couple of years, but even more so when we were at the Book Expo in New York this year, I couldn't believe even publishers who hadn't had a nonfiction children's line had developed one since last year because there's a lot of homeschool. That's a huge homeschool market. Think about how many, they, they need books. And I think the fact that all these parents, like my girls now have little kids, these millennials, and they, they, want, they want their kids to have enjoyment that, that's going to teach them something, right? They're, they're, so there's all these little, little Beethoven books and things. Or they want their kids to be learning as they're being entertained. So for every age group, nonfiction is huge. So that's a great way to break in. Um, also, other kinds of things that are within children's right now, uh, things like um, activity books. You know, somebody's got to write those with little games and little puzzles. And um, those, are, those are a big seller for, for companies like Carson DeLosa and um, Ideals, which is our worthy kids. I did a, a, a Walking with Jesus one and a, a story of, I think it was, did I do Noah? I think I did Noah. And so, that, I mean, those were, I still got, it was a work for hire, but I still got paid. And, it's still a book to put on my resume and kids, kids, those, those are things you see kids having in church when they can't do all the noisy games. You know, they'll have these, right. it have to be yeah. a big part of the church and not in kids church. They'll have these little activity books because it's still teaching them about, about the Lord. So those are, that's some things that are within children's. There's so many different ways that you can write for kids. It's not just a picture book. I think most people, when they think children's, they think picture book, but you've got middle grade and you've got board books and you've got YA, you've got nonfiction, you've got fiction. If you want to write for kids, there will be a way you can write for kids. And another thing, other than just books, is magazine markets. Like, every conference that you go to, you probably will hear that, like, Clubhouse and Clubhouse Junior, yeah. they give a lot of children's writers their very first publishing credit. Jesse Florida, who runs that, is very open to working with new writers. And you've got uh, magazines like Cadet Quest. I, there are a lot of conferences. Um, Keys for Kids, there are a lot of conferences. These are all children's magazines. There are entire books. I pulled this off the shelf to show you. Now, this is a year old, but... Um, this is just, this one book is just full of magazine markets for kids. Look how thick it is. Wow. That many magazines for kids? I didn't. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot of magazines for kids. So, and, and there, some are regional and some are, are you know, um, just for teach, you know, for, for um, nonfiction. That's more of a secular thing, like the ABA market. 
But pretty much no matter what you'd be interested in, there's going to be a children's magazine about it, and maybe you're the one to write for that. It's great that while you're working on your, on your children's books to be getting some publishing credits in magazine and online uh, magazines as well, not just the print editions, because it's going to build up your, um, your children's writer's resume just by getting published in, the, in that magazine market. And then when your book comes out, if you've got some established uh, editor relationships with some of those magazines, then whenever the next time you write an article, it can say, um, if you like Joe's writing, check out her new book, you know, Winston, the Bulldog's Adventures. And that's like free advertising with all these, all these like built in buyers. You know, they're going to want your book if they like your article. It's, it's so it's, it's, there's like a win win there. You get paid, you get to build a kind of a platform along the way writing for magazines. And then those relationships can help you publicize your book when it comes out. So I always tell people don't just do books. I don't just do books. I still do magazines because it, it benefits everyone. And also magazines typically have a broader reach than books. So if you're wanting to really just get a message out, like if God put a message on your heart for kids, uh, a, maybe a typical picture book wouldn't sell as many as the circulation that this magazine goes out to 120,000 homes. Well, if you have 120,000 book sales on your first picture book, that's good. Yeah. That's unheard of, right? Unless you're like a celebrity yeah. or something. So if, if God just put a, a, a message in your heart, the magazine's a way to get that out. So that's those are, I know I'm just rambling, but those are lots of, of things about like how to break into the market and different kinds of areas where you can write for kids. There's not just one way to do it. There's lots of ways to break in. I didn't even know that book existed, the one you just showed us. I know. So, because you ever... <laughs> one right everybody has this um the children's writers and illustrators this is the writer's digest version everybody has this and you should have it yes. it's, but i like the way that um this is the institute for writers i like the way that they do theirs because they have one that's just for magazines and one that's just for book markets so two huge books yes. where this one has all of it in one you can see the difference so i like i kind of like this is also microscopic type i feel like as i get older i'm like I have to hold it over here to read it. <laughs> this one's got a little bit bigger words, and you know, you, you tend to get more than just a paragraph. You get like two or three um, paragraphs about, and not, not just like one. Okay. I just think this is genius. So if you want to get this one, it's um, the Institute for Writers .com, and that you can usually get last year's cheaper. They they still have it on there. Um, yeah, you're gonna want the book one and the magazine one. I loaned my book one out, like so. I'm gonna have to, I have to get a new one anyway for this year, but. I don't know who has it. So I was going to show it, but somebody loaned it out. Okay. Well, let me just say something in my new book that's coming out. My, the book that I've created that um, there's, it's a book lover's companion. And one of the pages is if you loan out a book, you put down the name. That is so smart, Joe. That is so smart. Like, like your own little library system. Yes. And if you borrow, you know, if you borrow a book, you put it there on another area so that you know who book you borrowed. And that you can I like that. So yeah, that's so because you know you give it out in the honor system, and then I forget. I don't know who has it. I mean, I've loaned a lot of things out, but my favorite story about that is um, I preached this the other day. I kind of have trouble saying no sometimes. I'm a people pleaser, and I, I've struggled with that. Now the older I get, the less trouble I have with that. But in my younger days, I really struggled. I was on every committee, and you know, I I took care of everybody's kids. I mean, I just couldn't say no. And so my sister's like, "You really, you have a problem. Like, you need to." take ownership because it's not fair to your family and you're, and you're always stressed out. So she said, I, she bought me this book about setting boundaries. And I'm like, okay, you know, how to say no. And then somebody has to borrow it. And I, I couldn't say no. So I to read it. That girl got the boundaries book. I mean, that's when you know you have a real issue. So yeah, I definitely need your companion guide. So I don't want to go. Yeah. It's true. It's true story. Oh, that's funny. Okay. So, so I think I heard one of the things in just starting to write was that you tell us that you really need to know, you know, to know like children's books, you need to do research, you need to really invest the time because for me, like I want to do a children's book, but I'm to the point where I have to invest the time now. Yes. I mean, that, that is, I was listening to, I like to listen to a lot of these children's writers blogs. I mean, you can go online and Google and there's several, I, there are several that I really like. And one of them I was listening to the other day while I was getting ready, um, this guy just went around and interviewed all these top selling children's writers. And most of the, none of these were CBA market people, most of them were ABA market. But he would, I mean, these people all have, you know, hundreds of books or at least some that have sold hundreds of thousands, like they're very well-known people. And every single one of them, he, he always asked them, what would be your one piece of advice to give to somebody who's just breaking in? And I always listen because people ask me that a lot. And every single author, not one said anything different than every single one, not knowing what the other had said, 
said, I would tell them to spend a lot of time reading the genre in which they want to write. If you want to write picture books, you need to immerse yourself in picture books. Look, they're only like at the most 32 pages or 48 pages. You can read a lot of those in one day. Go to the library, get a table, get 60 of them and just read through them. You know, take notes, take what, what do you like? What don't you like? What do you think works? What do you think don't works? And don't just read what's the most popular now. Read some classics. Pick up Goodnight Moon. Why is that still, why is that still a bestseller? There's a reason. Pick up all of Dr. Seuss's books. You know, he's been dead a long time and his books still dominate usually six of the top 10 children's books, even now. And, and so I love it when people say, well, Ryan doesn't sell. I'm like, really? Tell that to Dr. Seuss. His are still selling. You know, there, there's just, you, they, what they really mean is bad rhyme doesn't sell. If you can do good rhyme, most of my books are in rhyme, you can, you can always sell because parents and kids like rhyme. So um, spend some time immersing yourself in the classics and in what's popular, like what's been really selling the last two to three years because the market changes pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and especially like, if, like, like, let's say you're one of these book about Winston the Bulldog. So if I were me, I would be like, okay, I'm going to go see what else is written about Bulldogs. Like, are there other little Bulldog books out there? Because I'm going to put that in my comparative section of my proposal anyway, but I just want to see what they're doing. So if I don't duplicate it, but I make mine better, you know, have something else a little sassier or something. But you, so I also will do like more strategic research and see who's doing what I'm doing, but how I can do mine differently. Um, you know, one thing they don't teach a lot in the CBA market, but I, as soon as I got in this writer's group called, they're called the nonfiction ninjas. They're like my little writer's tribe. There's 11 of us from all over the country, all women. And we're all nonfiction children's book writers. I love them dearly. Take a bullet for either one of them. They're all nice. They're all wonderful. But anyway, um, they talked to me about mentor text. And I'd never heard that term. I heard it a couple times at SCVWI meetings, but didn't really know what it meant. I didn't want to like show that I was stupid, so I never asked. I'm so sad that I didn't ask all those years ago. It could have really helped me. Mentor texts are simply just finding other books like the one you want to write and using that as a pattern so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You're not copying. You're not plagiarizing. But you know, like if you're going to do a comparison contrast book, well, then you should get one that's known for that. I have a whole handout on that that I can send you. Okay. Taught, um, I taught, I've already taught to the serious writer club, so now I can teach it to everybody, but it's called the secret sauce to successful children's writing. And, and, and there I talk about, you know, if you're going to, you need to read the Caldecott winners, you need to read the Newberry winners just to see what's going on with art and stuff too. Um, but when I'm talking about what I am now, I've got a whole section on that where I talk about uncovering those sorts of things. And knowing, okay, so if you want to write this particular compare and contrast, um, my friend Nancy Chernin wrote a book called Martin and Ann. And so it takes the lives of Martin Luther King Jr. and Anne Frank. They were born the same year in different continents. Like that's just a cool, that's a cool thing. And she talks about their kindred spirits. And she's, and here's what this recent review said about it. So this is like, I want to do a book like this. I'm going to, I, I bought it. I have hers on my shelf. Plus she's one of my nonfiction ninja sisters. So I bought it anyway, but I use this now as an example. It says the lives and legacies of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Anne Frank are drawn in parallel in this visually appealing picture book. Born in the same year on different continents, Martin and Anne both faced discrimination from the time they were school age. Yeah. Peers and former friends fell, um, they fell in line with laws and policies made by privileged groups of which they were not a part. Whites only signed and no Jews allowed. So, so she strikes this parallel, completely different kinds of, of, of racism and, and bigotry, and yet it just works. But this comparison kind of goes throughout the entire book of their struggles and their untimely deaths and just the, you know, the thing how, like the struggles and the things that they did that they were trailblazers. And I mean, as I'm telling you, I have chill books. Like it's an amazing book. It's a nonfiction book, and, but that's a great one. So if you're going to, why reinvent the wheel? If you want to write a comparison contrast book, if you've got an idea to do that, you need to get Nancy Turner's book as your mentor text. See how she handled it. There, there's lots of examples about that. So I think it's really important that, in the CBA market, we start talking more about mentor text. That's one thing that will really help you in trying to develop like your bulldog stories. Go out and see who else is doing what you want to do. Maybe there's a book about a chicken, but it's written in the way that you want to do your bulldog book. Use that as your mentor text and sort of, you know, take that pattern. Sure. Um, that's a really good tip I can give people, a prospective children's writers. I wish I'd known about it earlier. I, I just never be afraid to ask a question. I was in this group of, you know, hundreds of people and I didn't want to be the only one that don't know what that was, but I bet I wasn't the only one that didn't know what it was. <laughs> so make sure that I just tell people there's no stupid questions ask questions because all of us start well, you know we don't know things um what else am I going to say uh, allow yourself to go places in your children's writing that maybe you didn't originally think of so I love when I do these one-on-ones with people um, at conferences and they'll bring an idea and maybe the first idea they brought or the first story they brought wasn't particularly strong 
but I can see that they're a good writer. It's just, I know, I know the market and I know that's, that's just not going to sell for whatever reason. Um, or they just don't have a story arc, but you know, you always find something positive because there there's uh, usually there's some really good things in there. They just, they just got, they got lost along the way. So I will always, sometimes I'll have an idea for them that they hadn't thought of. And I, I can always tell who's going to be successful because pretty quickly I've knew this long enough. If they immediately go, Oh, I know that's not what I, that's just not the vision I have for it. Now that's okay. You know, there you can, you can be sassy and stand your ground, but if you're not open to trying other things, when somebody in the industry says, Hey, I think this will make a good devotional. And you're like, Oh, I don't do devotionals. Who told you you don't do devotionals? Did God tell you you don't do devotionals? Well, if he didn't, then you're just being stubborn and try to see if you can write one. I think it's really important to allow yourself to explore different areas of writing. I mean, I didn't know that I could do children's devotionals, but I'm pretty good at it. I'm glad that I took that chance. I mean, yes, it was out of my comfort zone, but I'm so happy that I stepped out of that because I have so many devotions for kids now. So I, I, I kind of kind of poke the bear a little bit when people say, say they don't do that. Oh, I don't do that. That's not, that's not what, I, what I'm called to do. And I, I respect mission statements and callings. I think you should have those. But I also think that you shouldn't be afraid because most times it's fear driven. They don't, they're afraid to make a mistake. But you have to allow yourself to have that sloppy copy and to learn the craft. You have to you have to write. You should write every day. If you're wanting to do children's, you should be reading children's every day. And just even if you're just writing like a couple of, of, of spreads, you know, like like 20 words, four lines, just just because you'll get excited about it. And you, you know, make that your pet project, keep coming back to it. Okay. Um, there's nothing more fun than writing for kids. I can tell you that it's like, they're the most appreciative audience. Now they will also call you on your stuff. They will, they're very honest. If they hate it, you'll know it. If like, they don't hold anything back. Um, but they, they're also very appreciative and they're very loyal. And, and I love that God has opened the door for us to be able to write for these little hearts that are still moldable and shapeable. And some of these kids may never hear it from anybody else. You know, they're not getting it anywhere else. And so if we have a book, like I have a book called God knows you, I mean, you can see their, their face come alive. He, he knows, how does he know me? And he knows how many hairs are on my head. Are you kidding me? Like they're freaked out. They're like, oh my gosh. Like it's, it's amazing when you see, you see the wheels turning when you're reading it to them. It's such a fun, it's such an honor and it's such a fun calling to be able to write for kids. So I'm excited that you're jumping in. This is, you're going to love it. it. It's really fun. Now, I, it's not an easy, it's not an easy genre. People often think writing for kids is way easier than writing for adults. And I can tell you having, I do both on a regular basis way harder it's quicker because you know i'm not doing like a fifty-five thousand word or a hundred thousand word book but sometimes that those 150 words will take me a very very long time because each word has to count every every spread is to move the story forward you know there are no free words in kids books you can't just kind of describe everything and have these fun little you just don't get to do that because kids are off your lap and down the hall at least the little ones are well what i tell people when they say oh i don't think i can do this or you know I'm, it's not where I believe God has called me to go, which it might not be, but I share with them a little bit about my story. And in 2007, so I'll share this a little bit. In 2007, yeah, I was injured, severely injured in a car accident. Mm -hmm. And I had a traumatic brain injury. Oh, wow. And I lost the ability to read, to write, to function as a human being. I mean, oh I, I was in really bad shape. And one day, this was about two years after that. I was in my living room and I put on some music. And in the midst of that, I heard this, not an audible voice, but I heard this and it was, um, what can I give you, my daughter? Mm. And my response was immediate. Mm. It was, give me your heart for your people. Mm. And I have to tell you from that day forward, things began to change in my life, slowly. You know, do I function extremely well today. Nobody would ever know probably that I've had any issues in my lifetime. Um, is it scary to think about writing? Absolutely, especially since I used to work as a legal assistant, so I used to write briefs and everything. Sure. I lost all of those abilities, so I relearn what I do today. And wow. so my heart is to encourage people to know that nothing is impossible with God. Oh, I love that, Joe. I had no idea. What a testimony. Holy it, cow. That's, it, a, that's, I mean, that's powerful. Yeah, what they don't know is that in 10, I, somebody hit me again and it took me further back. So I had two accidents that really devastated my mind. And 
what God did was just powerful. So and about yeah, our journey, that, that, yeah. all of that gets to gets to be part of your story. Like all of that that you, the, the the struggle. Like what I've heard several people say. I don't know who's actually quoted by saying it, but that you don't have a great testimony without several tests. And yes. you have, like you you've lived to tell about. It. Like your testimony is amazing, and that's going to touch so many people. I mean, it's truly God. I will say. And I love that you'll be able to tell that to like little kids. Like maybe you can do a devotional about nothing is impossible with God. You know, and you, I mean, that's kids need to know that because yeah. there's a lot of kids who come from situations that seem impossible. Maybe so, something just got birth. Yeah, right. I mean, that's that is powerful. And I love how you said with an audible voice. I know what you're talking about. It's like that little inward voice. I always say it's not like Charlton Heston or Morgan Freeman, yeah. but it's like you know, it's God because it says, no. "Well, know my voice." You know, we're a sheep. We we know the voice, and that. Um, I, you know what it's God. And so that's, that's amazing. And I love that you didn't ask for something selfish. You asked for, give me a heart for your people. Don't you know God loves that? That's just, I love that. I, I am, sh I am literally shaking right now. Just that is really cool. All that God has done. Wow. wow. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we can have church right now. I'm telling you. We can I, I feel like we really could. <laughs> you know, one, one last thing my husband told me every day I would say before he went to work was, Jesus, just one more day. Oh, yeah. And I have to tell you, I don't remember any of that at all. But I know that he was there and he was working. Mm. So if you feel you. like you can't do it, just know that with God, nothing is impossible. Amen. Amen. You're living proof of that. Yeah. I love that story so much. That's one of the reasons when I was working as a journalist at the newspaper before I became a children's writer, you know, I was a sports writer. But, but I, also, I also covered lots of feature stories. And you know, God would just place these people in my path to tell their story. And many times it would be a story like that where you're just, and you know, it's a, it's a, it's not a Christian paper. And I would have to, I couldn't just ask about their faith, but almost nine times out of 10, God would just sort of open that door where they'd say, well, you know, if it hadn't been for God, I'm like, I knew they were a believer. And I'd be like, <laughs> I, would just, I sensed it, you know, that because you have that kind of knowing. And I would, I, so I'd say, tell me a little bit about your testimony. Tell me, tell me what did God speak to you? And, and I would get this beautiful testimony and they would put it on the front page of this secular newspaper or even it's in a small town. It still was owned by a bigger company. And um, I would love how we would sneak God's word in all the time. And I think that I'm, I'm telling you that because I think we still do that even with children's books. Um, if you want to be in that big, beautiful picture book wall in the back of like a Barnes and Noble, it's hard to get back there. And like the Christian section, the, they call it the religious section, is like this big in the corner. Like, you know, nobody wants to be in the corner. Don't put baby in the corner. Nobody wants to be in the corner. <laughs> but that's where our books are if they're, if they're labeled Christian. So there's a way to, you know, weave those, those morals and those, those life lessons and that, that, that love of God into a book that can actually be on the big, the big picture book on the back that somebody's going to pick up because they're not going to go to that other section. So I think that I, because I did that with, um, with my journalism career, I've been able to do that some in, with the children's books. And I always just ask the Lord to open that door. Like, how can I, how can I tell this that, that more people will read it? That it won't just be, oh, I don't read that. That's a Christian book. But how can I tell it and it still be a Christian book? And I don't water down the word, but that somebody can pick it up who wouldn't pick up a Christian book. Like, that's a big calling, but that's what we're up against right now. So I mean, I write some just funny, silly books, too. And as a journalist, I write some, you know, really educational kind of books. You can do it all. You don't have to just choose, I only do this or I only do that. Um, I think that's what's fun about this genre. There's so many different areas in which you can write for kids. I mean, if you like to write puzzles, you can write puzzles. If you like to write nonfiction, you can write nonfiction. I know right now that um, that Cadet Quest, they were looking for, uh, and so was and Clubhouse Junior. No, Clubhouse, not Junior. Clubhouse was also looking for kids doing great things. So, like, if you know of... Uh, a kid in your community, a child in Fort Wayne or whoever, you know, whatever your community is, and they're doing something big for God or they're doing something big for the community. Maybe they are somebody who's knitting baby blankets for the preemies or somebody that goes to the humane study and reads books to the dogs. They, you know, people do this. Maybe that's somebody you could profile and it could end up in either one of those magazines. Like that's a great way to tell somebody else's story as you're learning how to write for kids in a magazine format. There's, there's just so many opportunities. I, I just, I wish more people would just, not be afraid of it and, and but I also wish that this is my other wish I have two big wishes that the people who want to write for children take the time and the care they do with their adult stuff like the stuff that they're writing for the adult, not the adult market but for people who aren't children um I, I just wish they would take that same time and care to get to know that this genre you know to really like we talked about immerse themselves in the books and and spend time listening to children's you know write, 
a writing for children podcast and it just just spend some time pouring over some of these books there's always articles in here I have lots of, of helps I mean I, I read lots of these books that that teach things I, I've got a whole shelf of them and half of them are my desk I've been looking at them but I have I buy these things because I want to be educated I want to always learn you know that when we stop learning when we stop if we think we've arrived we think we know it all that's that's the kiss of death that's when you know a lot of get better you'll know everything you've ever known like that's that's all you're ever going to know because you think you know it all so I always buy things like this one's sell books and get paid uh, doing author school visits so you know people are always like well how can I make money as a children's author well this is one way to do it um I just there's just there's so many teaching helps I have on my shelves I just I want I want you all these prospective children writers to really just immerse yourself in the genre itself but then also in all the, the helps there's so many out there I'm going to send some handouts for you guys but you know at writers conferences I always pick up all the freebies off the table, all the different magazines and the and the right guidelines for all the mag for the children's magazines and things. Because there may be a day where you think, hey, you know, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna profile this child who's doing this cool thing at our church, and they'll have all the information. I mean, you can find them online too, but I have a whole trunk over here full of that stuff. <laughs> because every time I, I pick up another, I'm like, I wonder if they got a new theme list. I better get the new theme list. A lot of them work on themes, you know, so you want to make sure that you hit the right month when you're pitching stuff. Okay, um, you know, I don't want to, I know this is going to end up being a part two somewhere down the road. Yes, I hope so. Yes, so I don't want to hold you up anymore because I know that you're getting ready to go on a wonderful vacation. I just cannot wait. Oh, so, I'm like 18 everybody, months. Really everybody, nice to everybody who has been listening, we thank you for being with us, Michelle Medlock Adams. We so appreciate you. Oh, thank you for having me, and we will do this again, and I'll send you guys handouts. All right, honey. Have a wonderful vacation. Thank you so much.